Welcome to the 2014 Gubernatorial Candidates Forum on Energy, the Environment, and the Innovation Economy. My name is Elizabeth Saunders, and I'm the Massachusetts Director for Clean Water Action. This forum is sponsored by 30 groups that collectively represent hundreds of thousands of members across the Commonwealth. It would take too much time to list them all, but the sponsors are posted by the door where you came in. In particular, I'd like to start by thanking the organizing team who put this forum together that was led by George Backrack, Sonia Hamill, and Nancy Goodman. All of them put in... Those three in particular put in countless hours to make this event a success. I'm also pleased to announce that today we are carbon neutral. <laughs> Thanks to local nonprofit, the Mass Energy Consumers Alliance, the electricity used at today's event has been matched with 100% Massachusetts wind power. That's pretty cool. We are honored to have five candidates for the Office of Governor of Massachusetts here with us today to discuss some of the critical environmental issues facing our Commonwealth. All the candidates who are competing in a primary and whose campaigns met very basic uh, campaign standards were invited here today. As it happens, the five candidates who accepted our invitation are uh, competing with each other for the Democratic nomination. And I'd like to introduce them to you. From your left to right, Joe Avalone, Don Berwick, Attorney General Martha Coakley, Treasurer Steve Grossman, Juliet Kayyem. Our forum today will be expertly moderated by Boston Globe columnist Derek Jackson and Secretary of Commonwealth Development Doug Foy. The format of today's forum will include some questions that allow for a 90-second response from one candidate with 30-second rebuttals from others if they wish. Other questions will be rapid-fire, seeking a yes or no answer only from each candidate. Many of the questions that will be asked today have been sent to the candidates in advance. Our goal was not to stump them, but to engage in meaningful dialogue about issues. Please hold your applause during the forum so that we can keep on schedule and get to the wide array of issues that we'd all like to talk about today. We have also invited you to submit a question, and those of you who are technologically inclined can tweet your questions with the hashtag GreenGovernorForMA, which is on the sign here. Alternatively, you can write a question and pass it to the end of the row, and volunteers will come by and pick them up. I, I will caution that about 180 audience questions have been, in, asked, has been asked so far, and so we will not be able to get to all of them. Please don't take it personally if your question is not answered, but I do hope you'll find that a lot of the issues that people are looking to bring up today will be in the questions that, uh, the, that were pre-prepared. Now, before I hand this to Doug and Derek, I would be a lousy organizer if I did not ask this assembled crowd to take action. The corner office will soon be occupied by a new governor, but first we have some business to finish with the current one. <laughs> so please take a moment to fill out the postcard that you, was on your seat when you came in so that we can collectively send a strong message to Governor Patrick that we're counting on him to do everything he can to help us meet the uh, greenhouse gas emission targets for 2020 that are required by the Global Warming Solutions Act. Yay. When you fill out the postcard, please pass it to an aisle, and if folks on the end don't mind collecting them, um, volunteers and staff will come by and pick them up during the event. Finally, let us pause for a moment to take in the power of this crowd gathered here today in this historic space. This podium that I'm standing at, I was told, was has been used by Frederick Douglass and Lucy Stone, among many mm -hmm. other powerful figures. Fortunately, or unfortunately, we are at a critical point in shaping the future of the planet and the future of the human species. 
More and more science is suggesting that the planet may be unable to support life as we know it in my lifetime if we don't make drastic changes in the way that we do things as a society today. We were not actually planning on hosting such a large event. In fact, we had to move from our original venue because of the overwhelming interest in this topic. In this room are hundreds of people who passionately want to see this ship turned around. And these are just the people who have the ability to be at an event in downtown Boston at noon on a Friday. (laughs) You will also find people who want to see change but couldn't be here today because they are busy weatherizing a home in Pittsfield (laughs) or teaching a science lesson at an elementary school in Worcester, leading educational programs at a state park in Douglas, treating patients at a health center in Dorchester, making energy efficiency light bulbs at a factory in Fall River, studying green chemistry at a ca- in a classroom at UMass Lowell, on duty at a fire station in Lynn, discussing green purchasing in a corporate boardroom in Framingham, at home in Barnstable nursing a baby, fighting for life in an oncology unit at David Dana-Farber, on a fishing boat off the coast of Gloucester, and preparing the land for spring planting at a farm in the Pioneer Valley. Those people could not be here today, but they are with us. So friends, we are not alone in this struggle, and the power, whenever you feel that you are, remember how many people are here in this room. We are not alone in the struggle to turn the ship around. Candidates, when you take a stand for the environment, we know that you take a stand for all of our health and our well-being, and we will stand with you. So. Let's talk about where we stand. (laughs) Derek and Doug, take it away. Uh, So, this is on, right? Okay. Um, So, the format, as uh, as was described, is we're going to ask a series of uh, longer questions. Each candidate will get one. The other candidates are welcome to uh, uh, add their thoughts in rebuttal or addition. Uh, Then we'll have a series of uh, pretty quick yes or no questions. Those are always going to be fun. Um, And then we'll go back to some lengthier questions. Uh, The 180 questions from the audience uh, that we already have in hand, many of them are going to be covered in the questions that were prepared, and then we'll try to reach some of the additional ones later. Um, I just want to, as we jump in, I want to add my comment to this historic hall and uh, the privilege of being a citizen in Massachusetts with the history that all of us have uh, been benefited by and that we cherish today. Uh, I am proud to be an American, but I'm equally proud to be a citizen of Massachusetts. And sometimes when I go elsewhere in the country, I'm uh, surprised to see how little attention to these issues is paid in other states. And here it is, it has been a prominent feature, environment and energy have been a prominent feature of a long history of <coughs> gubernatorial leadership, both Democratic and Republican. I happen to work for a Republican governor. Um, uh, but that brings us to today where we have extraordinary candidates for this office. So we hope to get some of these issues out, uh, good and clear positions. Uh, We're not trying to trap anyone. Um, And so we'll start. We're going to go alphabetically down the uh, table. Um, And uh, Derek and I are going to share this. We may interrupt if we think we'd like to burrow in a little bit more. But um, uh, first question, Joe, is for you. uh, And it regards smart growth. So um, smart growth, the notion of growing intelligently and wisely, uh, growing our economy and our communities throughout the state, um, has been a feature of a number of uh, efforts in the state, both in this administration and prior ones. Um, What steps will you take as governor, uh, such as statewide zoning reform, increased incentives for transit-oriented development uh, that would promote economic development while preventing sprawl and protecting the natural resources that the Commonwealth depends upon? Thank you, Doug. Uh, well, first of all, we are a relatively dense state, <clears throat> certainly in the eastern half of our state, and smart growth is absolutely essential for environment, for quality of life, for uh, reasonable transportation, for housing even. So I think it's important that we uh, do allow for smart growth planning, and so I'm going to support everything that would facilitate and support that. I certainly uh, would um, 
support legislation that would create more tools that would be available to uh, local governments so they can more easily uh, combine the elements that are necessary for smart growth into, so that may mean zoning uh, changes and the like. I also would support uh, expanding uh, Executive Order 525, which is now being used for the South Coast Corridor, but effectively would then require that other regions in our state um, identify lands that we want to make sure are kept for preservation and others that would be available for development. Um, and I uh, certainly would support expanding uh, the Brownfields uh, program uh, so that that would make other uh, places available. I also uh, am going to push hard on a carbon tax, carbon revenue neutral carbon tax. I was the first candidate to come out for that. And in doing so, that's going to change a lot of behavior. Thank you. That's the kind of massive behavior change that we're going to need that's going to drive things like smart growth to become a reality here. Thank All right. Thank you, Joe. Other comments from any other candidate? Sure. Don. Uh, sure. Well, I, I think preservation of open spaces, avoiding sprawl is really important. It makes our communities more attractive. It's good, good for the environment. So I, I, I think smart growth is smart. We're, uh, <laughs> we're, we need to support denser housing, transit-oriented development, like Joe said. I think we need to continue to push ahead on the 40-hour <clears throat> zoning program. I think that's, been, that's very – has a lot of potential and needs to be pushed farther. And, of course, all this depends on a strong public transit system. So we're going to have to be really serious. That's going to be a keystone to making this state environmentally responsible. And I think some of the programs to help communities do preliminary planning for smart growth really helps uh, zoning and uh, uh, land use issues. So 30 seconds is quick. Um, everything that I think the next governor should do, I think, should relate to conservation, mitigation, and reclamation. I think it underlies what we've been trying to do and what we can do better. On this particular issue, uh, as I look at turning our economy around in economic development, I think that this has to be integrated and aligned with our green development. So that as we look at smart growth, particularly in regions, I agree with Don on transportation, on 40R, but this has to be part of an integral part as we build a strong economy for everybody. It has to include this element of green growth. Okay. Uh, well, I just, uh, we asked to hold the applause, and I think it will actually – I think we all want to hear what the candidates have to say, and so the applause cuts into their time. So I would ask at the end, build it all up. Get yourself <laughs> all cranked up so that they get the suitable applause at the end for all the really great questions and answers they're going to give us. So, Steve. So I'm looking at best practices that we're seeing some of the most innovative mayors in the Commonwealth uh, implementing. I'm looking up in Haverhill and I'm seeing what Jim Fiorentini has done in terms of zoning reform that is bringing way more people living downtown near transit hubs. I'm looking at what's happening in Somerville where Assembly Square will t – we have 15 percent can walk to the T now in Somerville. By 2019, 85 percent of those people will be able to walk to transportation hubs. So there's some best practices out there. Also, I would double a historic tax credit for rehabbing older mill buildings in downtown areas close to transportation because I think that will stimulate people living, working, playing, and staying in downtown areas. Great. Thank you. Great. Two additions uh, to this discussion. I am the first and stood out about two months ago to uh, uh, promote and support uh, recapitalizing the Brownfield Trust Fund. We just have to do it, if not add more to it. It is, if you look at these cities and the gateway cities and how they are going to grow, it is going to be based on uh, changes to their brownfield and the, and the economic development that's going around there. So you look at Pittsfield, for example. So that I have already been out on. The second issue is uh, policy and planning and, and looking ahead at what these cities and organizations can do. So I would commit to more resources for mass development to help communities. This is what they already do, local governments, plan growth in a strategic manner rather than piecemeal. It's the only way smart growth is going to work. Thank you. Derek. This one will start with Don. Uh, recently, uh, the state uh, ch changed ar lead and arsenic limits, uh, tightening restrictions. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> recently, the state changed lead and arsenic limits, uh, tightening them uh, on the surface, but um, loosening them or, or allowing more uh, deeper down. Uh, are those the kinds of adjustments uh, that you agree with? And uh, are there particular toxic chemicals that should require legislation to be replaced by safer, uh, safer alternatives whenever economically feasible? Are there any specific ones you can think of? 
Thanks, Derek. Well, for, I'm a pediatrician, and I've seen the effects of toxins in kids, and I think we need to work very hard to get these toxins out of our, out of our environment. Um, we should do this based on science, scientific evidence, but there's a lot of evidence there. Some of it's developing in this, in this state with the, with the um, green tech uh, processes going on around, this, around the country. But uh, there's leadership actually in Lowell. Joel Tickner there is leading investigations of, of, that, of uh, clean technology. That will give us a scientific foundation for making appropriate legisla legislation and regulation to keep these chemicals from entering our, our, uh, our uh, environment. I'm for the Healthy Families Act, and I think, yes, we should be tightening up regulations for companies so they're choosing the greener alternatives when toxins are in the, in the environment. We don't need them, and we should get rid of them. Yeah, if I can add to that, you know, one of the issues is 1%. Um, uh, I think it should be more than that, particularly around some of the enforcement issues as we've gone after those who violate lead paint laws in buildings that harms kids. As we look at, as best as we look at other uh, toxins that are out there, we certainly don't want to add new ones in. And the ability to both educate people and enforce that around particularly uh, commercial violators is really important to send the message. It's important for public safety, it's important for public health, and the governor and uh, the other constitutional officers need the budget and the authority to do that. Well, I think the 1998 Toxic Uses Reduction Act certainly is a model. I support Jay Kaufman, Representative Jay Kaufman's attempt to expand that uh, Toxic Uses Reduction Act to cover consumer products. I think we should, over time, uh, work to reduce the purchasing by the Commonwealth of toxic chemicals to be used in consumer products. And finally, we've got a Toxic Uses Reduction Institute up at UMass Lowell. It's one of the most important and pioneering institutions in the country that I think can be used as a model and can be a source of new, fresh, bold, and innovative ideas to reduce toxic chemicals in all parts of our lives. Uh, as a state and as governor, I would want to lead by example. So there's two ways to do that. You support science. You support uh, institutes like at Lowell that actually come up with valid scientific uh, support for uh, what is a toxin and what is not. And secondly, we are a huge, as a state government, we are a huge consumer. We can drive the industry through the dollars. You see this with the Pentagon and biofuels, right? We can do the same if we commit to purchasing uh, non-toxic uh, substances. As a doctor, I also understand the, uh, how toxic chemicals can impact uh, our health and absolutely do uh, weigh in on some of the diseases that we are faced with today. And so I uh, completely agree with uh, being aggressive here, and that includes expanding the uh, Toxic Use Reduction Act to consumer products. I think we can take a lead in our state. Uh, big retailers are moving this way anyway, so our suppliers, if they develop that way, uh, will be ahead of the game. I also think um, this is a great uh, potential innovation uh, area for us that we as a state can, uh, can excel in. So I absolutely support the, the expansion. Uh, the next uh, question is going to go to Martha Copley uh, regards climate change. There will be a number on climate change. Um, <clears throat> and uh, later we'll talk about what one does to mitigate the effects and how the state is already pursuing those issues. But uh, it's increasingly clear that we're going to also have to learn to adapt to the consequences of climate change. So Superstorm Sandy devastated New York and New Jersey. Um, it, had it come 200 miles north, it would have devastated Boston and parts of Massachusetts coast. Uh, and so the question is, what, as governor, what will you do to begin to prepare the state for those consequences, the flooding, the storm events? Um, what are your plans for adaptation in the state regarding climate change? Sure. Well, I know we're going to say it a lot today, but we, we do have to keep to our goals to uh, change climate change. And certainly I believe that not only reaching our 2020 goals and our 2050 goals, but setting those interim goals that the governor should lead the way on uh, to make sure that we are on track to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I know we're going to talk about that. In terms of the storms, um, you know, I'm proud to be from the Attorney General's office that went to the Supreme Court and said uh, that we have to do something about climate change, federal government, EPA, because we're losing a foot of Cape Cod every year. The uh, standing issue that we are definitely seeing an impact even back in uh, 2004, 2005 from climate change means that we have to first, I think, 
do an effective and a realistic risk assessment about what it means for our coast. Now, whether we work with other regional uh, governors to do that, certainly with the federal government, to make sure that we understand what the risks are so that we can then act to mitigate them are really important. We know from what FEMA has done on the flood mortgage issue that they sometimes jump to conclusions that aren't right. So we need good science. We need that investment to assess. And then we need to act on that. Um, maintaining natural barriers, whatever uh, artificial barriers are going to be effective, understanding our geography, because we know that the risks to Massachusetts, particularly our urban areas, low-lying, could be devastating. We're lucky we escaped that. I think it starts with risk assessment and then the will and the energy and the funds to uh, make sure we implement the changes we need to realistically uh, mitigate and then uh, work with those communities if the damage is done. Now, we seem to be going in order here, although we can jump around if you'd like. But I'll, I'll turn to Steve because he obviously was about to say something in any way. Well, I think we, first of all, need to put a cabinet-level leader in place, a cabinet-level director reporting directly to the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, but working with all, across all levels of state government to put together a comprehensive climate adaptation and preparedness plan. We operate in state government much more too often in silos. We don't communicate enough with each other. This is an issue that cuts across a whole series of disciplines. The more we can cut across disciplines, cut through the silo approach to government, it's better. And finally, we have best practices. Look what Spalding just did to put all of its electrical and mechanical devices on the roof of the new building, which is at sea level. We can do that again and again and again. Let's use best models, best practices, and implement them to a far greater extent than we have before. As some of you know, I come from a background in Homeland Security, which is essentially about risk reduction, and this is the biggest risk I see. If I were to be governor, I will not be the woulda, shoulda, coulda uh, governor. And it takes at the very day one, which I proposed in my comprehensive adaptation plan, uh, a person in my office dealing solely with adaptation. Because not only does it cut across state agencies, it cuts across 351 cities and towns. This is not a home rule issue. This is not something that Boston can deal with by itself and let Quincy figure out the oceans at another date. This will require a comprehensive regional planning by the governor, because only the governor can get uh, uh, localities to look outside of their own uh, boundaries. I agree with uh, Governor Patrick's uh original plan to put $50 million into coastal protection uh, and, uh, and mitigation efforts, so seawalls, other kinds of natural protections, and also developing uh, backup generators and generation equipment that uses uh, low emission or uh, renewable technologies and the like. But I think uh, we need to also continue to take the lead as a region and maybe as a state uh, for our nation on greenhouse gas emissions. We have these targets, but we're going to need a carbon tax and other renewable energy uh, to actually meet all these targets. We need to take the lead in that. Special day for me regarding carbon, because at 5 o'clock today, my third grandchild arrives by cesarean section. And I'm thinking, I look, I look at my kids and grandkids. We've got to do something about this across the board. It's so crucial. We should be the beacon for the nation. We have to do the investments my colleagues have talked about. We need a director of climate change, at uh, climate adaptation at the cabinet level. And we need to protect our wetlands and floodplains. These really are, are, are nature's natural barriers, and they help us. Uh, this is going to have to be an area we're going to have to recover from the mistakes we've made in the past and then get really, really serious about getting, getting off carbon, end of story. Thanks. Uh, transportation mm -hmm. is responsible for almost 40 percent of Massachusetts greenhouse gas emissions. And Boston, uh, by many measures, is America's fastest growing, uh, has the highest growing rate of congestion in the nation. Uh, some cities, London, Stockholm, several others around the world, have instituted congestion fees and other ma uh, measures to limit cars in the city. Do you uh, support such measures? If not, what would be the first thing you would do as governor to reduce congestion, which would then, of course, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by our vehicles? And uh, that would start with uh, Steve. I'm not sure that I would – I'd be willing to look at those options that other cities have adopted. I, I think that we really have to understand that implementing and spending every dime of the transportation bond bill that hopefully the governor will sign very soon is a critical ingredient in reducing 
congestion, the more quickly we invest in 21st century transportation and infrastructure, the better we're going to be. I mean, that's obvious to all of us. Um, we obviously have transportation issues that are well beyond the governor's 10-year plan, and we've got to implement new ideas and new approaches to that. I think we put far too much of a burden on our uh, lower and middle income families. They bear far too much of the burden. I would call that uh, environmental justice issues having to do with transportation. And I think we have to make sure that we invest in transportation that will serve those underserved communities to a far greater extent than we have to this point. But there is absolutely no question that um, in addition to all of those other things, we've got to promote other methods of transportation, uh, bicycling, walking options, other transit options. In other words, there's going to be a full portfolio of options designed to reduce congestion, reduce our carbon footprint, and help those communities that are underserved and that are low and moderate income who have borne the price of this disproportionately to the detriment of their health and well-being. This is an area where I'm incredibly optimistic because I do think there's a new generation uh, uh, growing up that are not committed to owning a car as I was at the age of 16, that are bicycling and walking, the, the, and what the governor is committed to in terms of tripling uh, those in the next 10 or 20 years, people who actually commute. And the obligation of the next <laughs> governor uh, is to actually make that easier for them. We cannot sit here and say we're going to get more people out of cars unless our transportation, the, our re regional transportation authorities and the MP BTA are sophisticated, modern, and ready for a global economy. And so that's why we need to focus on transportation and keeping people able to move quickly, efficiently, and with ease, uh, so that they're because they are willing to get out of their cars if we help them. Well, mass transit is clearly uh, part of the future and needs to be an important part of it. I think we can do a lot with what we with, with the current mass uh, transit. I, th I believe that the Green Dot plan, which is essentially to take new transit vehicles and make them low emission vehicles, also other kinds of vehicles it should be hybrid vehicles and the like. Uh, so there's a lot more we can do, uh, even with our current infrastructure. I also agree that we should start using greenhouse gas as a key criteria in planning new infrastructure projects as one of the uh, criteria for. Uh, prioritization of them, and I think that will drive us in the right direction. Uh, public transit is absolutely key. We're way underinvested in it, both in state of good repair and innovation. I'm excited about what's possible with innovation in public transportation, smart streets, uh, complete streets, really modernizing communities so they're attractive places to live. That has, also has to do with housing density and the open green spaces we talked about. I'm excited about the electric vehicles, vehicles possibility in this state. We now have a 25 percent goal by 2025 with eight other states. I'd like us to lead in that and be the state that actually shows the rest of the country how far we can go with EVs, and there is a, 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 a justice issue here because air pollution affects the most disadvantaged people in our commonwealth. We need to, we need to get, get at that fast. So I think this ties into the answers we gave about smart growth and looking at better transportation now as Boston uh, needs better transportation and connectivity so that people who are now moving into the innovation district, for instance, can get in and out and reach uh, places outside the city where they live or where they will live in the future. Uh, the mo keeping our goals on uh, transportation for 2030 that's other than cars and looking at hybrid cars. I just want to add one thing. Uh, it seems like a small thing, but in the Attorney General's office, we brought a suit against bus companies that let their buses idle, uh, and we got a huge fine from them because that was adding to the pollution and greenhouse gases. All right. Uh, this is going to be the last of this round, and it's going to a uh, question for Julia. <coughs> um, uh, the U.S. has been the beneficiary of uh, enormous boom in gas, natural gas production, fracking, which is very controversial, and we'll get to that later, but uh, we have a lot of natural gas now. Um, there is quite a lot of uh, effort to expand natural gas infrastructure, including a new pipeline coming across the state, which itself is quite controversial. Um, uh, the good news about natural gas is it's a lot cleaner than coal. Um, the bad news about natural gas is it's still a fossil fuel. Yeah. Uh, what is your position on 
natural gas in general and the expansion of natural gas infrastructure in this state, including the construction of the new pipeline. Right. So uh, my position on natural gas is that it is better uh, than some alternatives, uh, but that it is actually a bridge, as we all know, and we being dependent on natural gas will not satisfy the commitments we've made for either 2020 or 2050. Uh, so how should we think about natural gas in this time period? What I know now is that the alternatives for renewables, right, which is what we're all committed to, uh, it's, it's the only rational way to go in terms of both storage and transportation is that we're not there yet in terms of the infrastructure. So we do, I'm not going to oppose natural gas infrastructure at this stage because I need to make sure as governor uh, that I can satisfy energy needs while promoting efficiencies and promoting alternatives. How do we promote those alternatives? I am uh, the candidate that has proposed a green bank because I do think that the next wave for renewables is going to be those companies and ingenuity that are working with our citizens and our educational facilities uh, to push and make storage and uh, the distribution of renewables, something that is feasible in our lifetime. And I think in some ways that's the resolution that you saw uh, in the Salem coal plant, right? That both were going to use it as a transitional uh, 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 sort of, you know, uh, transitional compromise, but also commit uh, to uh, a renewable and, and looking into renewables. That is uh, the way it's going to look the next 10, 20, 30 years. I, ha I have a long-term plan for this, uh, knowing where we are today and knowing that as governor, I need to have redundancies in the system. I don't want to become too dependent on any one thing because if that thing goes, uh, you, you all can't uh, move forward as a state. None of us can move forward as a state. All right, I'm going to do something really radical here. I'm going backwards down the list, okay? <laughs> Living on the edge. Living <laughs> yeah. on the so edge. So stick with me here, okay? Steve. Well, first of all, I think we've been in a lot better shape if we recognize, as the Boston Globe pointed out this morning, that when you're losing 20 to 40 percent of your natural gas through leaks that are taking place all over the state, if we required those companies that are leaking natural gas to buy some kind of carbon wrecks or fix the leaks, and we compel them to do that, that would have a pretty big impact on the amount of natural gas we need and reduce rates. And second of all, I do oppose amendments to the Green Communities Act to require the purchase of lowest cost energy, because if people are buying natural gas today, it's going to kill our, natural, uh, it's going to kill our renewable energy industry and hurt job creation. That we can't afford to do. Just as a comment, the uh, interesting thing about natural gas leaks <coughs> and losses is ratepayers pay for those yes. losses right. rather than the companies having to absorb them as a, a so wasted asset. So let's have the companies be responsible for the leaks or pay uh, if they're not going to do it through the use of carbon wrecks. Yes, and, and thanks to CLF for doing that uh, bit because not only is it expensive, it's obviously dangerous to uh, people in the area, as we know, and so that piece is important. And as the advocate for ratepayers, uh, it is important that the utilities both do the infrastructure management that they're supposed to do to sustain that infrastructure and not pass along those costs to people, uh, particularly the leak issue. You know, in addition to that, I think we also need to make sure that our uh, reusable portfolio uh, standards are maintained so that 15 percent by 2020, uh, we keep to that. And, and as a, a bridge fuel, which it is now, uh, we don't invest more than we need to or should, and we should keep the emphasis on our renewables. Yeah, I mean, the answer is going to be in renewables. Right now, we are stuck, and I'm very worried about our dependence on natural gas. That, those leaks, by the way, they're not just dangerous and lose gas, but that's methane, and that's, what, 50 times more powerful than carbon dioxide is the greenhouse gas. Uh, the pr prices will, are highly volatile in the natural gas space, and the, uh, the supply is unreliable. We don't have it here. We have to bring it in. So I think we need to get off it as fast as we can. We, it's, we've got to use it as a bridge. I, I wish that weren't true, but uh, our, our aim has got to be to replace it with non-carbon producing sources. The, uh, the gas leaks are horrendous. There's 20,000 of them in our state, 3,000 of them in Boston. It has the, uh, has the uh, danger that we alluded to and absolutely has the greenhouse gas effect that Don was talking about. This is huge. This is not just a thing to deal with uh, lightly, and we have to take care of it. All the gains we've had from efficiency in the last two years have been erased by the leaks. So we're back to square one until we get those leaks. I also think that uh, we uh, need to, it's a sunsetting uh, approach to deal with natural gas. It isn't interim fuel. So new power stations that come online should have a sunset provision on how they're going to move on to renewables. All right, I think we're now going. Thank you for those answers. We're going to the to the one shot yes or no questions. So this is going to be. I think Derek has the first round. So uh, 
Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> State spending on environmental protection agencies has been deeply cut. Uh, now less than 1% of the overall state budget, which Martha referenced a, a little while ago. What should the level of funding be? Mm. It was, oh. are you asking me? Yes. It was 1% in 2001. I think that's a good goal that we should get back to in the four-year period that we, I think we can get there. It uh, certainly was cut back either in the first part of the decade and then really cut back during the, uh, during the recession to now about 0. 0.6. I think we need to get back to 1%. I just want to say that I, that was supposed to be yes and no, yes. but I changed it slightly. <laughs> I changed it slightly to see, because everybody's going to say yes. So I want to see what's, what level yeah. of spending. We're on record now. Two uh, sentences. Are we clear that everyone says yes? Does everybody say yes? yes. Yeah. We're at 1.2 percent. Uh, we're at 0.6 percent now in the Commonwealth. We, I looked at what we need to invest in. I'm at 1.2. I think at least 1% or more, and I think that means not just in the agencies like DEP, but look at the budget for the Attorney General's Office for enforcement and other areas where we're going to integrate. So I think it clearly has to be a lot more than 1%. Uh, I was proud to be the first candidate for governor to publicly endorse the 1% standard, which I believe is doable, and I would do it as governor. Uh, yes, uh, at the 1%, but I... You know, the way that the next governor has to think about this issue is holistically. So it doesn't even include our transportation budget, which I would view as part of a green philosophy. And so 1% at the very least. Okay. The true yes or no's. Carbon tax, yes or no? Yes. Yes, it has jobs. Only if it doesn't affect Massachusetts competitiveness. So I don't think we're ready for it yet. That's great. <laughs> okay. uh, I would agree with Martha, yes, as long as it doesn't affect competitiveness and as long as it doesn't disproportionately impact low and moderate income families. Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. okay, I want to go back to that now. Yeah, uh, we, so, uh, yeah, so uh, let's hear some comments on we, we have, we have the Remy competitiveness. Study. The Remy study shows it adds to the gross state product, it adds 10,000 jobs. We have the data before us. Why wouldn't we go there now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 now you're being naughty. Now you can't do that. I think they, okay. It's their time, not yours. You get it at the end, okay? And we got all these questions. If you want these asked, you can't be interrupting. Okay. <laughs> Joe. The key to the carbon tax is revenue neutral. Uh, there is a model. British Columbia has a model. They've had it for five years. They've dropped emissions and kept the economy stable relative to all other pro uh, provinces. We, we can do it. It is doable. We should do it. That, that'll get the behavior change that we need to meet our emission targets. So other states are looking at it. I'm happy to look at it, as I've said. But Massachusetts, if it's the only state that does it, I'm not sure that it doesn't affect our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other states and within our state. Open to it. I'm just not sure we're ready what, for it. What about a revenue-neutral carbon tax where you actually reduce some other tax that is yeah. disproportionate? Say the corporate tax. And you, and you substitute the revenues from carbon tax and then work on the carbon tax going forward. I'm happy to look at it, but I still believe this is one of a portfolio of remedies that we have to keep on our goals and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm just not going to say yes because everybody wants to hear yeah, it. Okay. Okay. Steve. So let me just uh, add, uh, very seriously looking at this, but I do think that we need more than anything else to create jobs, particularly in our renewable energy and clean tech sector. We want to make sure we don't inadvertently undermine our competitiveness. And in addition, I want to just put it right out there. Taxes oftentimes can be regressive, and people who are low and middle income sometimes can be disproportionately negatively affected by it. I want to make sure we do it in a way that does not hurt those low and moderate income families. So I'll start at yes and then add a lot of caveats, because I do think that there are things we need to look at. I think the biggest issue for us, uh, and but that's how you get to yes, right? And then you're going to compromise with all the caveats. Um, I do think one of the biggest questions will be, well, well how will it interplay with Reggie uh, in terms of other states and, and our obligations under uh, Reggie? And I think that's just an important question to work with our neighbors about. What I will say is uh, uh, that, that it is something that is doable uh, with all the necessary caveats. I think those are consistent. Okay. All right. Gas taxes support transportation. Well, and just to be specific, the gas tax was indexed to CPI in the transportation bill, um, and there's now a, uh, a ballot initiative to try to repeal that. What is your position? Are you in favor of the gas tax and indexing yeah. it to CPI? Gas tax, yes. Index, no. Gas tax, yes, with indexing, but I'm 
re very aware of our regional equity issues. We have to make this get off it as fast as we can. Uh, yes, on both. Yes, on both, because otherwise we can't pay for our transportation plan that we all need, want, and insist as being a centerpiece of what we're all about from a climate change standpoint. Can't, can't do it without the yeah. indexing. Can't be done. Yes, on both, and I will, uh, when in the corner office, actively oppose the ballot initiative. Okay. The Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. We know, we know the Keystone, uh, Keystone gas has a higher uh, rate of carbon in it, carbon pollution, and we, we, I'm against Keystone. But we can't fight it alone. We'd have to get other states together to do it, and I'd, for, I'd vote for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, I, and along those lines, a regional carbon standard that would uh, eliminate those fuels that come in that are dirty would be an important way to go for the next governor, I think. I oppose Keystone Pipeline. Uh, I, I said in answer to the question that I oppose the, the pipeline as we as currently understand it, which is that it's not safe. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say ever, but I'm going to say right now what I know. Uh, oppose it. You need to focus on cleaner fuels. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, one more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Um, what is the single most disappearing species in Massachusetts that's oh. most important to preserve? I'm going to guess bees. Bees, that's right. So, Martha, your answer was? Bees. 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 I'm worried about the collapse of the honeybees. Honey Moderate Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Climate change deniers. No. I think, Martha, I think the Attorney General is right. I think it's, it is bees. Uh, it's because they're just a reflection of something bigger uh, going on. The second has got to be with climate change occurring in our oceans, which, let's just be clear here, none of us deny climate change. I mean, this is this, is this party. Uh, and we have to start from that basic scientific fact uh, that lobsters Julia? moving south. Lobsters. Lobsters moving south, but they're leaving us for ocean reasons. Uh, ground fish to support our fishing industry. The endangered species is us, and uh, we have to get serious about this. So. <laughs> all right. That was Good creative. Answers. Okay. All right. All right. So another collection of uh, yes, no's. Okay. Um, oh. We're going to go backwards uh, down the, the group. Um, would you support a ban on fracking in Massachusetts? Yes. Yes. Yes, unless we can show that it doesn't harm water or create earthquakes, which we cannot now. So the answer is yes, folks. Yeah. The answer is yes. I, you know, I'm getting very upset with this commentary. From the, no, we've got some great questions here, so we're going to get to them. Thanks. Don? Yes, I oppose it. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes is all the way. Um, do you support uh, a moratorium on new trash incinerators in Massachusetts? Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. Actually, I meant no. I, I mean, I, I think that the, what the Patrick administration is trying to do uh, with some uh, – I get to explain this because I'm the only no uh, – with some of the changes is, I'm, is that I think it's actually going to be a transition issue for us right now. So I'm not going to say yes right now. Okay. Um, currently, the Commonwealth invests a relatively small portion of its pension funds – I think it's hmm. $1.4 billion – in fossil fuel companies. And we know that fossil fuel companies are part of our problem with climate change. If elected, would you divest the fossil fuel holdings from the Massachusetts Pension Fund? Let me start with Steve, since you oversee these. Well, yeah, I'm the state treasurer. I do oversee them. I chair the pension board, and I have come out in support of Ben Downing's bill to divest because it does have a key provision in it that would re that, that it does have a key provision in it that would mitigate losses in the public pension fund. We can't afford to put the losses on the backs of the taxpayers. Ben Downing's bill takes that into account. I fully support the bill. I discussed it with him yesterday. All right. Thank you. Julia? Yes. So Steve's answer is really a yes but, but I agree with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do we get back yes. to talk more about this later? We do. Okay. I support the serious position, which is I would divest from truly irresponsible fossil fuel, and I want to use our, tax, our uh, shareholder power to change the way these companies behave with respect to research and their uh, failure to book a stranded, uh, stranded uh, carbon sources in the ground. I think we can exercise power if we keep it. Yeah. So, that's yeah. <clears throat> so that's a sort of a no, use your power as a shareholder. All right. Yes, done responsibly. Okay. All right. D Doug, just, uh, just 
one thing. Martha said, no, Steve's answer is yes, but. Steve's answer is not yes, but. Steve's answer is yes, and I explained it by explaining, for those who don't know it, that the bill has in it a provision that would mitigate against losses. That's the reason I support it. That's the reason we all support it. My answer is yes. Okay. All right. Well, it's good. You guys are being very clear. I'm proud of you. This is really very It's very hard to be clear in one word. I know. I know. I know. We're doing our best. Okay. uh, Last one on the yes-nos. Boston just passed a building energy rating disclosure ordinance, so it was basically scoring buildings on their energy performance. BIRDO is the Mm -hmm. acronym. We can come up with a better acronym, I think. (laughs) Um, And it applies to uh, larger commercial and residential buildings. Um, Would you support such a measure statewide? Uh, I, I would, and but with this, but let's just see if if the program works. I mean, we're right now in this perfect position to see if the Boston program is working. So yes, if it works. I would urge every other city in town to adopt it, but I would not mandate it. I think I would urge them strongly. I think it's up to the cities and towns to adopt something that makes good sense. I wouldn't require it. I wouldn't mandate it. Yes, I would support it with, in working with municipalities. I support it. Okay. Joe? Yes, I support it. All right, okay. good. We got a nice question from the audience. Okay. Um, this is personal. Ooh. And I'm going to uh, slightly amend the person's question to say, in one sentence, please, just one, what's the single most important thing that you and your family have done to reduce your carbon footprint? Anybody? Well, we know Don's. Don has a great yeah. answer. Don has a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in a cave. <laughs> One sentence. It's, One it, sentence. It, it, it's a long sentence. Um, there's a standard called Passive House that's essentially a zero net energy house. Uh, we built one. Uh, it has no furnace. It's, uh, heat, it's R80 walls, R160 ceiling, and has um, no. It, 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 it basically works with your body heat when you're. Uh, when there are enough people in, in the house. And it, we now put solar panels on the roof, and we just a zero bill this year, this uh, month. I think a lot of us could have used a house that works on our own body heat this winter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess it would be our uh, use in Medford of single stream recycling. We do about 75, 80% recycling, which, by the way, as governor, I would like to see every municipality do single or dual stream, whatever makes more sense. Uh, single most important thing we've done in our family business, Grossman Marketing, was that seven years ago in 2007, we switched all of our power from carbon fuel to 100% certified wind power and required all of our subcontractors to do exactly the same. Uh, I have three school-aged children. I see mothers out front here. This is the issue for them. Uh, urban living, bicycles, walking. We live in Cambridge. Uh, our school uh, and, and where we live are very close. I think it's the most important thing is, is getting kids out on bikes and walking. Joe? Uh, well, see, apparently Steve has the wind at his house to, uh, to run his whole household. We don't really have that much hot air at our house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want a second home. <laughs> Uh, recycling, we champion it in our town. It's obviously something that we all should do more of, and I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Actually, this came in an email, um, uh, which is also a personal question for uh, all of you. Um, what was the last thing you did recreationally? <laughs> And it has to be clean. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Stop. Oh, you thought that? Oh, man. We are running for governor. There's not okay. that much fun. Yeah, you can't go there. <laughs> or it's all fun, I guess. <laughs> all uh, right. Joe, let's start with you. Well, uh, kayaking. Mm-hmm. Kayaking. Where was that? In Nantucket Sound. Uh-huh. Oh. Cross-country skiing, as you know, because we've seen you on the trail. Yes, <laughs> in Waterville Valley. You bet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You're assuming we have time for recreation, but <laughs> yeah. I still do walk my dogs at the Middlesex Fells and uh, the Mystic Hi. River. We live near the Mystic Lakes and Mystic River, so we um, bring our dogs down there. Great. Steve. And we clean up after them. <laughs> <laughs> Which has been pointed out by a favorite person of mine, uh, that if you had come back to the, from the past, uh, or... Um, and arrived here, been out of sync for 25 years, the thing that would astonish you the most about society today is that people pick up their dog poop. Yeah. <laughs> probably really. Wow. I mean, really. So if we can do that, we can do probably anything. Exactly. Okay. Steve. 
I think I did that this morning at <laughs> 10 minutes of 6. <laughs> uh, kayaking on the Santa Bill River with Barbara. We love doing it. I'm a long-distance runner, and it's been so cold, I finally got a run in around Fresh Palm Reservoir. All right. Thank you for that. Good. Uh, fortunately, uh, we're not in the western states um, um, where the water is running dry. Um, I'm personally, I've seen two wild, the smoke from wildfires obliterate Yosemite Valley and um, uh, the National Forest of New Mexico. So with all the attention nationally to water issues, Massachusetts and the, a lot of the eastern states, water is not in the news quite as much. Is there an issue of, about water that is under the radar that is a priority for you if you become governor? Is this a 90 second? What, what is the time? This is back to the uh, 90 second. Okay, sure. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about gas, uh, gas tax and indexing, and I'll come to this. I am for the gas tax. I am for future gas taxes. I do not like indexing of any tax tied to any kind of economic indicator. It's a backdoor tax. People resent it. Taxpayers resent it. It isn't sustainable. It's politics as usual. It's what they don't like about Beacon Hill. I think we should take that stand. We can, we can defend increases as we need them for, uh, for infrastructure projects and for the environment. And that's the way we should operate, full transparency, not backdoor tax <coughs> increases. Uh, as far as um, the water infrastructure goes, half of our water in our streams and uh, rivers do not meet quality standards, and one-fifth uh, uh, is uh, below streaming standards. So uh, I agree with the uh, sustainable water initiative that would uh, permit uh, withdrawals so we can put in place reasonable conservation measures when we need them. I also think we have to be very clear about um, infrastructure improvements to make sure that we don't have storm water and wastewater from storm surges and others leaking into our, uh, into our estuaries, into our rivers, and even in, along our coastline. So we have a lot to do to make sure our water uh, stays pure and is available to us. I uh, met with Clean Water Action and was really stunned by the data they were showing me about the, 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 uh, the, the problems in the infrastructure right now. The leakage is, is, is enormous. We've got a big backlog we've got to fix. But my one major issue right now is Cape Cod. The uh, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution there, the runoff, is, is very serious. We need a regional solution on Cape Cod. And as governor, I would really get every community together there and let's get that one solved. Uh, it's dangerous and it's really going to harm a, a treasure for our state, the recreation, rec one of the recreational centers in the whole state. We've got to, we've got to do something about it. So, Derek, I think the underlying assumption, your question, is a good one. I work with Western AGs who have a conference, and they worry about that all the time. We don't, and I think we've assumed that we take water for granted. It's not a problem, but we have seriously underfunded uh, what we, do, we need to in our municipalities throughout Massachusetts, in addition to what uh, Don has mentioned, and making sure that we're aware of the problem, that we prevent pollution uh, in our water supplies, invasive species, and making sure that uh, we are aware of what we need to do to invest uh, on those wastewater uh, water supply issues, uh, making sure around sewer that we do a better job than we do. We do take it for granted here, and we can't. So first, the Patrick administration is developing new regulations for how we allocate drinking water. I look forward to implementing those. Second, Don mentioned Cape Cod. I chair the Mass Water Pollution Abatement Trust, which we are changing the name to the Mass Clean Water Trust. Um, under my chairmanship, we actually just sent in the last few months $3.35 million to the Cape Cod Commission to study all the new technologies and a, ma a wastewater management system that could be a national model. And finally, let's not forget we have an extraordinary water cluster, water and infrastructure cluster in terms of technology and new companies. It could be a $10 billion industry. It could create a lot of jobs. We should be a national center for water research and technology development. We will be. Uh, just two additions to this. The first is going to be obviously major uh, state agencies are involved with this uh, that have their funding decrease. Water is uh, something that we can't neglect any longer. So our discussion about 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever it's going to be, we have to commit to the state agencies because, as we've all uh, noted, a lot of these issues are not going to be uh, just be able to be dealt with by a municipality. We are going to have to have regional approaches, whether it's the Cape, but whether it's the North Shore or the South Shore. Uh, we need to have science-based approaches to create a more resilient water structure for the future. All right, next question, another radical move. I'm going to go to Juliet, so oh. we're not going to keep it. Don, you get to rest for a bit. Um, I, 
a number of you have already mentioned uh, the question of environmental justice. Um, uh, it's clear that some of the worst of environmental harms, whether it's pollution, traffic congestion, um, whatever the effects of things such as incinerators and power plants are disproportionately visited on people of color and our low-income communities. If elected governor, what would be your strategy to try to address those problems? So I started off as a civil rights attorney uh, before I got into public safety. So uh, commitments to environmental justice uh, and to uh, communities that often don't have a seat at the table is how we have to approach this. Environmental justice is part of an overall aspect to making sure that communities that get harmed uh, by whatever it is uh, actually have a seat at the table. So there's a couple of issues that I've already mentioned. I just want to put them because they are environmental justice issues. Uh, the first is, of course, this, how the state itself allocates resources, the siting of whether it's a, a waste management site or where, whatever else. We need to look at what the state is actually doing, because often it's those decisions that harm uh, minority communities, impoverished communities. So I want to be the best actor, right, as governor, because then people follow suit. The second uh, is, of course, brownfields. If you think about our gateway cities and who lives there, right, it's a lot of times minority communities and impoverished communities, uh, uh, our commitment to gateway cities is a, is a commitment uh, to environmental justice, essentially, and to changing the way we look at brownfields, recapitalizing on brownfields so that there's uh, growth. Uh, finally, I want to look at the state's new urban agriculture pilot program, and this essentially parks, right? It is getting uh, opportunities for kids uh, to be part of the environment, to be part of parks, to grow their own food. Uh, that, you know, my kids are part of City Sprouts. They're at a Cambridge Public School. These are opportunities for them uh, to to treat the environment well and to be part of an environmental dialogue. Those are all important parts of, of the future of environmental justice in the state. Comments? Uh, let's go backwards. Sure. Jump. Uh, I'm hoping to go forward, not backwards. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I, uh, I certainly agree that if you drive around the state, you see the disproportionate burden that uh, members of uh, poor communities and often communities of color bear on where our power plants are, where our big polluters are. Uh, and where the traffic is most dense, et cetera. We have to do better than that, certainly going forward and fix what we can. I agree with Governor Patrick's uh, uh, environmental justice uh, executive order that he is uh, in the process of implementing, and I think we need to fund a, a position, a director of environmental justice, uh, to make sure that happens across the agencies in the state government. Don. Well, it is and will be throughout this campaign for me a theme uh, that we have inequality in society we can't live with anymore. Uh, the, the root cause of so many of the problems we're living with in education and transportation and health care and in, 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 in our environment is poverty. And, and we have to look to the root here. And I, we, will, we will fight poverty as hard as ever in, in, under administration if I'm there. Uh, specifically with respect to the communities that are stressed right now, I think air pollution is the thing I'm most on my mind as a pediatrician. I see the results of vehicles, of dense vehicle traffic and so on. So everything we can do to reduce carbon in the atmosphere and reduce vehicle emissions and, sta and uh, stationary source emissions will help these communities more. And I would, we, we need to go there. Thank so you. we do see disproportionate effects of climate change on poor communities, I think, uh, and particularly on environmental justice. Uh, let me give you one example of what I've seen, is we've tried to end health care disparities, for instance, in uh, poverty, uh, communities of poverty that don't have access to good health care. We know that, for instance, asthma, uh, as well as diabetes, are big drivers of that. If you are a child with asthma and you have to go back to an apartment building that's filled with mold, you're not going to get better. And if you are in an apartment building uh, and you do not have access to exercise or the fresh fruit and, uh, that we're talking about, you are uh, having a, a disparity. So looking at smart growth, I think we go back to smart growth and how we develop uh, fairness for people who live in poor communities. Thank you. Well, these are issues in addition to environmental justice, of public health, of economic fairness. And it seems to me that a director of environmental justice cutting across cabinet secretaries is a good idea, but equally important is to put together a diversity and outreach council so that you get input from those poor and disadvantaged communities that are going to be disproportionately affected in a positive way by investments that we make. And finally, I would like to find a way in which we could underwrite or fund, maybe through electric utilities, maybe part of the state, maybe it's a joint effort, public-private partnership, subsidized energy audits to protect and preserve and to create more energy efficiency within low- and moderate-income families. Those families would benefit disproportionately, put more money in their pocket, and I think we need to do that sooner rather than later. All right. Good. 
The Harvard Forest uh, over the last several months has been giving us some good news that New England has uh, largely reforested uh, up to about 75, 80 percent. The challenging news, though, is that in Massachusetts, we have all, the last 20 years, we've been losing that forest back to development. Do you, what, is you, what fresh idea do you have to balance development and holding on to the forest we have? And we'll, who goes first? Steve? Steve. Can we go first? Well, yeah. What will you? We just, you went just in yeah, me. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first thing we do is we spend the resources that we have, the environmental bond bill that is pretty much a done deal, has significant funds in it. I think we need to spend every penny of that, 45 to $50 million at the very least, uh, to make sure that we hold on to those public lands. It's an absolutely critical ingredient of what we, we do. Uh, and second of all, even though the most important issue in any campaign, in this campaign, is going to be jobs, economic development, broadly and widely shared, leave no one behind, we know that there are many regions of the state which regard their own economic uh, the quality of life to be inextricably linked to public lands and to uh, the forests which they see going to development. And I think this plays out in many ways in which a governor needs to play uh, an important and significant leadership role. Uh, I look forward to doing that. I look forward to working with uh, colleagues, particularly in those more rural parts of the state, in terms of their priorities, in terms of making their priorities my own. So I think this is an area where the, the framework I would use around conservation, let's keep trees that we have when it makes sense to do that. Let's do uh, mitigation, uh, looking at, as your question goes to, what do we do about trees we've cut down? And I think there are things we can do uh, in terms of replanting and encouraging people to do that. Uh, the third thing is, uh, you know, the uh, reclamation that we do uh, around that and make sure, I think, that underpinning this is the need for environmental literacy. Uh, so much of what you've done today in educating us and other uh, candidates is important, but the public needs to understand, including our kids in grade school, what important role trees play. And then you'll have the foundation for the kind of conservation and reclamation that you need. Our family's main form of recreation always has been out of doors, and I care deeply about preserving those open spaces and the forests and the beauty of this Commonwealth. It's also smart for us. It's a treasure for the Commonwealth. The kind of land we have um, is the envy of a lot of other states. Um, I think the smart growth conversation we had earlier is key. We need to make housing planning smart, and that will allow us to preserve kind of the spaces that we want. And we talked about that earlier. I also am very intrigued at the movement in the state toward local agriculture and farm-to-table thinking in which the local land use becomes the property of the community. They think about it, and we can really support these uh, local agriculture, which is a w great way to preserve, to preserve land. I think uh, this is critical to what Massachusetts is, having the wonderful forested land that we have. Uh, we have to preserve it. 22 acres a day are going mm -hmm. to uh, sprawl, development essentially of sprawl. Um, and uh, I th the most direct thing we can do is to make sure we uh, continue the uh, conservation land fund at $50 million. And also, I agree with increasing the tax credit limits and the, and the, and the uh, limit overall of benefit for people that want to put uh, land in conservation. We need to continue that program. Uh, we know that one dollar invested in land conservation returns four from uh, economic activity of, of uh, outdoor recreation and tourism in our state. So I'm for increasing our level of commitment to conservation because I, I think not only I think it's actually an economic boon. It's also good for the world because people do come here to ski and surf and spend time on the Cape. I think it's very important. I'm also don't like the either or aspects of this. I think there's a lot of lessons learned in green infrastructure and blue green infrastructure. It's the ways of which builders and architects and regional planners are actually thinking about working with the environment rather and open spaces rather than destroying it. And I think as a governor, you can actually promote that kind of creative thinking in the future. Uh, let me just pick that up and then I have a couple, uh, just a related question. One of the interesting things about green infrastructure, uh, we all talked about climate, climate adaptation. If you think about the Esplanade, for instance, yeah. in Boston, it actually serves as an insulation barrier, if you will, to flooding in the Back Bay. And the Back Bay will be flooded by climate change at some point. And the Esplanade, if it's flooded, will recover reasonably quickly. And, and those kinds of pieces of green infrastructure, which came down to us as parks 
and recreational resources are going to become increasingly important as climate protection. Um, have you thought about that? And do you have, and this can be a quick answer by everyone if you'd like, about how that might fit into your administration as a policy strategy? Uh, well, just because I mentioned it, so because I, I do think, uh, you know, I I do think adaptation. However, sad it is that we are there, uh, so we, we should focus on mitigation. Uh, should be viewed as an opportunity, and it is those creative ways of thinking about the re built environment. Uh, in my world of Homeland Security, we talk in terms of resiliency. You don't throw up your hands and say, oh, I can't stop you. You actually build in a way in which even if the back bay were flooded, uh, that you would have uh, storm flows that would sort of protect the back bay or you move generators from hospitals. That's how we need to think creatively because we kind of have to accept uh, that the oceans are rising and that the temperatures are getting warmer doesn't mean we don't fight it uh, every day that we're alive, but we also need to protect ourselves and, the f and our children. I just want to make a quick point about the genius of the entrepreneurial community. I had the privilege of touring Greentown Labs in Somerville the other day. 41 uh, clean tech companies, brilliant ideas, brilliant people looking to grow companies, looking to build companies, looking to manufacture products in Massachusetts. We've got now, because the governor's leadership among others, we've got 5,500 companies, 80,000 people. It will double in the next seven or eight years. And a good number of those companies are focusing on exactly the issues that you talked about. So as much as government can play a role, let's make sure that those entrepreneurs who are creating new products and new ideas in the labs of our technology companies and in the labs of our great universities. Well, let's, let's free that up and let's use all of our resources of the Mass Clean Energy Center to focus on that and to boost that kind of entrepreneurship. It'll create jobs and it'll achieve those goals you laid out. Good, thank you. So that question kind of goes to what we talked a little bit on the Superstorm Sandy question, is to what do we do moving forward to increase our natural and, if we need to, artificial barriers for that kind of event. Uh, we sh should learn from what we've done for other reasons that also help us with this green infrastructure and make sure we look at other ways as we move forward to keep that supplemented and make sure that we're able to invest in that, not just gray buildings, but the green infrastructure. But it does have to be integrated, and I think everybody at this table agrees agrees that as we move forward with whatever development we do, whatever kind of mitigation of those events, we have to have that as part, front and center of what we do, particularly around green infrastructure. Yeah, I agree with uh, what's been said. I, I, let me just emphasize, nature gave us sponges uh, in wetlands and floodplains, and what used to be just a nice thing to do, make sure they're preserved, is now an essential thing to do. They're nature's barriers, and they're one, ways we can, one of the ways we mitigate the effects of uh, this loss of control of the climate. I think that um, it, it, it's seductive to think about a development of those areas, but now it's, it's important to our future to make sure those are protect, <clears throat> protected, that land is protected. Right. Well, the most direct way to take uh, a lot of these good ideas and make sure that they become reality is uh, to direct the, um, the Secretary of uh, Environmental and uh, Energy and Environmental Affairs to make this a part of the policy agenda so that we're thinking about natural barriers. We're thinking about when we do make improvements to protect uh, estuaries and wetlands, uh, that uh, we do it with, um, uh, uh, with green infrastructure technologies that, that use uh, kind of low impact uh, technologies to do it. So if it's on the agenda, if, it's, if it is uh, essentially an explicit policy goal, then it'll happen. Uh, Derek, you've got some, and I've got a couple from the audience that are short. Uh, sure. Um, you know, solar mass, solarized mass, um, and other private enterprises have been putting uh, uh, roof, uh, solar panels on tops of homes, primarily right now uh, with uh, families who can afford to put panels on their roofs. Do you have a specific policy prescription that would allow middle class, lower middle class, and low income families who own homes to put solar panels on top of their homes. It's, right. it's your turn. Just go first. So I don't have a specific plan, but I know that as all of us want to meet those goals, we want to increase both the availability and the affordability of uh, the mechanisms that will let people invest in and see they get their own savings from uh, energy audits. Uh, the first step would be to provide more access so people can do those audits of their homes. 
recognize what they would invest, what they would save. And I think the government plays a role in both providing incentives around solar, for instance, if that is the issue, as well as uh, providing incentives for people to see that they save energy, they save them money. Uh, and I think it goes back to what I really believe is a fundamental need for environmental literacy. When people understand if they get an energy audit, they'll save money, uh, we accomplish a couple of things. And I think we haven't focused enough on that. We all had a great forum at uh, first uh, Next Step Living that focused on energy efficiency. We only have about 80 to 90,000 homes that have those audits. I know we talked about it and will, about how we increase the ways that people can do those audits. But specifically around solar, I think people like the idea. And if they, uh, and we would work with everybody in this room uh, as a governor and cabinet secretary to say, how do we really push forward on this and have realistic goals to increase our use in solar? It's a great uh, uh, energy uh, and a workforce driver for us. We have a lot of development, not just around solar, but the company that makes the racks that we hold those in. We can keep that here in Massachusetts and increase um, the, our production and cut the cost for folks as long as they know about it. Anybody want to jump in? Yeah, we ought to be proud of what we've done. When the governor came in, this governor came in, we had four megawatts of solar in the Commonwealth. Now we're at 450 or 480, and we're, I think we're headed to 1.6 gigawatts by 2020. This is fantastic, and I'm a participant. I have solar panels on my roof, but I want to make them available to everybody. I think keeping a strong policy of tax credits, uh, make sure we, we, we advance net metering and, uh, and energy efficiency appliances, and I would like to try to make ways for people to be able to capitalize the installation of solar in small businesses and in and in homes, and it will pay in the long run. Of course, we save money. Remember, my solar, my energy bill in the house we built was zero last. Uh, my electric bill was zero last month. Steve, well, I mentioned earlier the possibility of subsidizing energy audits. I think that's that's the first place to start. Martha mentioned education. Education means you've got to also give people an opportunity to do it. If energy companies are incentivized, and this becomes a uh, a, a profitable thing to do if it is going to return on investment for that homeowner who doesn't have the capital to put into solar panels on the roofs and you get that money fronted by the energy company, they benefit by lower rates, the company benefits by the tax credits, and everybody benefits. So sometimes the public-private partnership here can work to the benefit of those low and moderate income families that wouldn't otherwise be able to make that investment. They should not be held back by their lack of resources. We can do this. I want to emphasize conservation. I think we are just scratching the surface, and we have to be a lot more aggressive about it. Uh, and I think meaning the middle class and uh, the large uh, group of people who so far have really not done that much. And I think the opportunities, especially in uh, older homes, around insulation, around uh, windows, replacement of windows, even drafty roofs and all the rest of it, create a huge opportunity for us. And um, I do would love the idea of a bill that would require uh, a home audit upon sale of a home that would love that would bring uh, new owners uh, to realize what they could do, and I think we can get a lot more there than trying to uh, do some of the other things that we've talked about. I think one of the problems with uh, the solar industry right now is that the volume is not high enough. That's one way that you could actually decrease costs. So uh, manufacturing is very complicated here. Uh, but installation uh, should not be. I think installation, having more people who are able to install solar power, uh, solar panels, will actually create, begin to create a market. So that's why my focus and the focus on community colleges and workforce development, uh, these are great jobs. These are great energy jobs. They are well paying. That's how we have to think about, you know, it's not just about solar panels, right? It is about a whole way of thinking about the future of Massachusetts being more green for everyone. All right. I have two questions from the audience. Now, just to uh, let you know, uh, we just got the five-minute warning here. Oh. So Five-minute warning. Oh, okay. Um, so these are two. One's short and one's a little bit longer. Um, so the short one is, how did you arrive at this hall today? On foot, by train, in a car, <laughs> in an SUV, uh, um, Juliet. Uh, in a in my personal car, but we did have four people in it. We didn't take four cars, so I just want to tell you that. Steve, there were only two people in mine. <laughs> I, I, I came in a car, but it was not an SUV. <laughs> Don, uh, we had we had we carpooled our whole staff came in the car. High occupancy vehicle that gets 30 miles to a gallon. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I would point out that these are very busy people, and the fact that they are arriving in car rather than transit is not a comment on the use of transit, but the comment on they're going somewhere else after this that may not be accessible by transit. Okay. Now the um, 
The other question, and I apologize for this because it got sent to me. I'm sort of fond of this question, so I will ask it, but I have a personal um, reason to be connected to it. Uh, when I was in government, I served under Governor Romney, who created an office that I headed called Commonwealth Development that actually banded together, sort of bolted together, broke up the silos between transportation, housing, environment, and energy. Um, it was, I thought, a really ingenious idea. It was not a new idea. Governor Dukakis had had a development cabinet back in his day that Al Rain headed. Uh, a number of you have referred to climate and climate change and adaptation as a place where you need to bust up the silos. Um, if you were elected governor, would you reinstitute or create a new version of Commonwealth development? And if so, what would its charge be? Let me start with Don. Yes, I and would. All, uh, everyone will get yeah. a full there, there's, there's a really exciting set of initiatives going worldwide now, which I guess would classify as in all policies initiatives. There is, the big problems we're facing now are they're systemic problems. They're not, they're not within departments. Health is like that. Kids are like that. Climate is like that. Environment is like that. You, you can't deal with this agency by agency. It has to be teamwork. And so I favor health in all policies, I favor kids in all policies, and I favor energy and environment in all policies. And if I'm governor, we're going to organize our, our cabinet level functions around those clusters of activity. That's how you get the back of a five-year-old kid who isn't succeeding. That's how you get the back of, of, a, uh, of, of health in a community. And that's how we can make climate do the right thing. Cooperation is absolutely everything. That, by the way, occurs not just at the, at the state level, but that has to happen community by community. And communities need to know that they can also cluster around an issue like this, get together and manage it properly. For 30 years, I've worked on improvement. That's the secret of improvement, cooperation like that. All right. Other thoughts? Joe? Uh, yes, I think any large organization, clearly the state government, has to move across agencies, especially in uh, this day and age with the problems we're trying to solve. So I think the idea of doing it, uh, it may be completely organizational, may be partly virtual, but clearly connecting them and their goals and their accountabilities is, uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, so I would favor it. And I would say, if you just think about smart uh, growth that we talked about earlier, that's an example at a community level. It's doing the same thing at the state level, and I think that is a very appropriate and necessary going forward. Um, to, oh, sorry. Okay. sorry. Julia. I know. Oh. So uh, I, I would definitely reinstitute something, and, and I'm just, just thinking of this now, but something along the lines of like a smart growth focus, because uh, we have to think about the challenges we face. There, you know, if you think of schools, uh, homes, and work, right? It's the cycle of life. And we need to think about communities as building towards making those experiences better for everyone and making them uh, more green. So I would focus on that. And then the second thing is just anyone knows that just saying that you do something as a governor doesn't happen. We really need to focus on the operational level of who's in these offices because the tendency would be the governor says it and then everyone goes into their silos. So you really got to focus on the multiple layers to work with 351 <coughs> cities and towns and break through the silos of geography that sometimes inhibit uh, the best solutions. All right. All right. Yeah. So it's really important, I think, to break down the silos, but we also don't want to lose sight of what individual missions are within something I've dealt with in the AG's office, understanding early on that we had an environmental division and an energy division. They had different missions, but when they overlapped, we worked together. So you don't take away the, you don't mush everything into one big mission, which is, I think, what happened with DCF, for instance, and so it's too hard to do. And there are a lot of overlapping missions here, but I think, as Juliet said, who you appoint is important, and make sure that you cut down those silos so that you have uh, uh, initiatives and places you want to go, but people accountable for accomplishing different things within your cabinet secretaries. All right. So this is exactly the way I've run the Treasury over the past three and a half years. We totally revolutionized the way we made decisions so that even though certain decisions you would expect would have come out of one group, for example, I joined a group of 70 institutional investors who control $3 trillion of assets, and I've challenged the largest oil and gas companies and electric utilities to be honest with us about climate change and stranded assets. That didn't come out of PRIM, the pension assets. That came out of an entirely different conversation. So when you break down silos and you cut across disciplines and you bring the best ideas and you create those kinds of cross-fertilization, that's when the best ideas are generated and that's when the best practices happen and that's where the public is best served. Okay. And we can't end this forum without a question on one of the oldest environmental issues mm. the state has always faced. Fish versus fishermen. <laughs> 
Traditionally, the Massachusetts delegation, as well as the governor, always line up with the fishermen because they're the ones who pack the state house uh, to get relief after the fish are gone. What fresh new paradigm do you propose to end this intractable debate between fish and fishermen? I think there's two things that we need to do. And by the way, I have great sympathy for the fishermen. This is an industry that's part of our culture, part of our history. And I, it would be a tragedy if we lost it, meaning we lost the fish and the fishermen. Uh, I think there's two things that we can do. The first is we need better science. I think the science that we're basing these decisions on is not accurate. And we need to, uh, I think we should develop the science right here uh, in our UMass system. I think we have the ability to do that. We certainly have a need to do it and have better, more modern, sonar-based ability to measure the ground fish and where they are and uh, is an important thing. The second, I think, we need to do is develop a fund to support fishermen through the downtimes where their permits are at risk. If those permits go, if they go to international companies or other things, the, the, the industry is gone. And I think the state needs to take a more active role in trying to essentially create a fund that can buy the permits and sell them back to the fishermen over time as the fish stocks come up. I think that's the answer. That's the way we would treat droughts in the Midwest or other kinds of things that were affecting farmers. I think the state has to take a much more active role. We cannot look to the federal government as the answer. It's not the answer. They're not going to care. We need to do it here in Massachusetts. We need to save the fishermen and the fish. Um, it's, it's uh, coincidentally, you would say this, mor uh, this morning I was talking with a fisherman in Gloucester and a third generation, and I agree with Joe that when your heart goes out to these people, these are these are culturally important, economically important assets in a commonwealth, and they're very much threatened and very frightened right now. The issue is debate about the science. The, the differences between what the fishermen believe and what UMass Dartmouth is coming up with and what, uh, what the feds are saying, it's, it's real. We need to solve this. And my, I think what I will do if I'm governor is appointed, I will have an independent scientific body that reports to me and this legislature and gives us the best possible science. Then we'll sit down with the parties and decide what the best, the best forward path is. But we've got to stop this, uh, this warfare. So, Derek, you and I have talked about this, and I have a long history, I think, of trying to get at the facts. It doesn't have to be an intractable argument. The fishermen know that if there's no fish, they are out of work. They understand that. And our argument has been in court that if a federal agency is going to come in and put people out of business, then they need to have facts behind it. That's all we're asking. Uh, we understand that there needs to be a balance. They understand it better than we do. Uh, but they have not been treated fairly by this federal agency. I'm not afraid to sue a federal agency that's not acting fairly. And in the short run, we need, uh, as both of my colleagues have said here, some help for those families. When those boats are sold, they will not come back. And the federal government has... Uh, put out regulations that work for deep water fishing in the Pacific Ocean, but are not necessarily applicable here. Look, there was an agreement here that was easy to reach that would have been a win-win for everybody. The federal government wanted to come along and cut ground fish by 77 percent. That was going to destroy the entire industry. It is in the middle of destroying the industry. The mitigation funds coming in the federal government. That's not going to put those people who are now bankrupt back in a boat. They will never be back in a boat. There was an agreement. Same thing about floodplains in southeastern Massachusetts. I think we have to find a middle ground and get to that point where we can keep people in their jobs and keep people and, and, and maintain the, uh, the, the supply of fish. That kind of compromise is something that governors need to be involved in, attorneys general need to be involved in, people of goodwill of all kinds need to be involved in. A arrogant approach never works, and in this case it certainly did not work. Uh, I have some history in this, both uh, uh, working in the state in Homeland Security, obviously with a lot of interaction with the port and the different uh, pressures on the port, uh, as well as during the BP oil spill uh, when you saw an entire industry almost get threatened. I think the answer is not that revolutionary. It is national ocean planning. It, it, it's, it's, it's literally there. It's law. Massachusetts is actually ahead on this. It is a way of thinking about the oceans in which conservation, fishing, recreation, the boating, industry. Everyone has a seat at the table and you plan for the future. And so I would be committed to making that work for all of us, for this state, but also Rhode Island and other adjoining states. That it's Planning is sometimes sort of the best solution, right? You just anticipate the crisis to come and you stop it because everyone is at the table at the beginning. Um, I think George is about to give us the hook. And so if I could suggest um, 
uh, that we'll give each of the candidates a one minute closing. Um, and but while you're thinking about that, mm -hmm. um, but I, but Doug, I, I think we just had news that we just found an issue where Democratic candidates. Uh, Criticize the federal government almost as much as another party. <laughs> While the candidates are uh, preparing themselves for their last minute with all of you, I want to thank the audience, all of you, first for coming here today, two for the respectful way you handled. I know you're all pent up and would have cheered for all those answers, and, and you really did wonderfully well on that, and there will be the chance for you to acknowledge the thoughtfulness of these candidates. And three, I want to encourage everyone here to vote. The reason you're here is to be informed about what these candidates stand for and then exercise the privilege of a citizenship by voting for your selected candidate. So thank you all for being here. And with that, uh, let me ask the candidates if you would like for closing remarks. And Steve, why don't we start with you? So thank you for doing this, both of you. Uh, there's one issue that has really not come up here. And I'd like to raise it because I think it's an important issue that we are going to have to deal with long term, and that's nuclear power. Um, there are two nuclear power plants particularly that affect the quality of life of the people of this Commonwealth. Uh, these power plants, one at Seabrook, one in Plymouth, are both obsolete and unsafe. And there is a huge role for a governor to play. I understand Nuclear Regulatory Commission does uh, reauthorize these, but I think it is absolutely critical, knowing that we do derive a significant part of our power from nuclear, knowing that it's not going away tomorrow because we don't leave the people of the state without the power, but the sooner we move on all the things that we have talked about here today, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of renewables, in terms of electric cars, etc., the sooner we can wean ourselves away and finally close those nuclear power facilities that are leaving vast numbers of people in this Commonwealth in a permanent position of deep, deep distress. That is a huge issue. That's an issue the next governor is going to be dealing with. I look forward to dealing with you on that issue. Oh, okay, we'll go this way. Yeah, perfect. I'm sorry, I get confused, but uh, you guys are, are mixing it up. Uh, so one thing we did talk about a little bit was science. I want to talk about a little bit more. I got into a little bit of trouble uh, with uh, some of the right-wing media because I said I won't debate climate change. I won't debate climate change. Uh, let me say it again. Uh, the science uh, not only has to be accurate, though, is that we need a commitment to the dissemination of science to our local communities, to our business leaders, to the public. It's not just that I have the best information if I were governor, but that you need to make, you all need to make choices based on science. And only in that way will we become a more prepared state for whatever risk comes our way. I have spent my career on risk reduction, on planning for the contingencies. This is, as I said, this is one that I don't have to think too hard and deep about. Uh, and so that is why I want someone in my office dealing with adaptation cutting across 351 cities and towns, over a dozen state agencies that own this, uh, because the science is, is, is uh, both changing, but it's pretty conclusive uh, that this state is vulnerable uh, to what Mother Nature is likely to bring our way. Let's do everything we can to stop it, uh, but let's also prepare ourselves. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for what a wonderful forum and all the organizations that, that went into it. Uh, I would just uh, like to leave this thought. Uh, we need to elect a governor who's going to be bold, who's going to break the paradigm, who's going to do things differently going forward. Not politics as usual, not conventional politicians, not resting on past laurels. We're not going to advance uh, a, a bold environmental agenda without a bold governor who's willing to come and shake things up and do things differently. I was the first uh, and maybe now I'm not sure, certainly the first uh, to uh, advocate for a revenue neutral carbon tax. We have to do that. That's going to require a huge effort. We can't hedge on it. We can't be afraid of it. We can't think that it's too difficult because it has the tax word in it. We have to go forward and do it. And if we do do it, we will, get the, we will start to meet the goals that we really know we need to meet environmentally to make a big difference. Otherwise, we have a huge disaster waiting 20 years from now for our children. And that's not a world that any of us want to give on to them. Thanks. Uh, the most important thing happening today isn't what we're saying. It's the fact that you're here. 800 people showed up for this uh, event. And that, that's the kind of grassroots we're going to need in order to change this country. This country is in trouble. It's in trouble across the board with so many areas of lack of investment in the social justice and the compassion and the thinking about the future. 
that we really need to, to, to have as a nation. This state's got to be the beacon. We can show what's happened. We could be the first carbon neutral state in the nation. We need what we know how to do it. The technologies are there, and I I believe that ambition is going to is going to is going to capture the future. So I believe we should be putting a price on carbon to make to make to make it clear what we're doing to our environment. We need to double down on our renewables, solar, and wind. And wind has got to go far in this state. The offshore wind resources, the expandable resource we have. Let's let's not get away. From, let's not dance away from. It, let's go for it. And conservation at a limit not for not not seen before in this nation. We need to be the example for the nation about what environmental responsibility really looks like for the entire country. Thank you. Martha. So I, I do want to thank ELM, not only for the briefing they've given all of us, but the great materials. And it leads to my first point. I'm really excited about the future for Massachusetts, but uh, what Donna said is true. It's you and it's everybody else in this state who have to push us to move forward, all of your elected officials. And I think it starts with environmental literacy, making sure that every generation understands how climate change came about. We did it. Uh, what we do to mitigate it now and what we do to reclaim the damage that we've done. I look at conservation, mitigation, reclamation is the important way in which we look at the framework for everything we have to do here in Massachusetts. And that future is bright, looking at um, the uh, environmental issues, what we've been able to do to align uh, our development of, of technologies, uh, workforce, uh, to make sure that we address these issues for our kids and our grandchildren. And it also means that we have uh, an alignment at the state level of the kinds of things that have to happen, not just with the governor, but with our cabinet secretaries, with our legislature, with you, uh, and with our not-for-profit or not-for-profit and private sectors. We did it in healthcare. We can do it in energy and environment. Thank you. George, um, do you want the, uh, George Backrack, who is the maestro of all of this effort and is owed a great uh, debt of thanks for pulling all of us together. George? Uh, Sometimes uh, those of us that are involved with this wonder why we do it, and the answer comes today. It's not just that you're all here, but in fact we made some news today. I think we made some news in terms of progress on our thinking on the carbon tax. I think we made some news in terms of our thinking on divestment of our, port, our, our pension portfolio. And I think we made some news today and some progress today in terms of adequate funding uh, for uh, environmental protection agencies. All that is important. But this is only the beginning of a process. And the questions asked today are only the beginning of a year-long effort where we need to ask all the candidates, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, where they stand. And the wrong question to ask is, are you with us? Hmm. Everybody is. The right question is, what will you do? Because we need to see concrete plans. Now, I also want to thank two of the best uh, moderators we've ever had. Doug Foy and Derek Johnson, Derek Jackson. I, I want to thank a very thoughtful uh, array of candidates who have sacrificed a big part of their lives to engage in uh, public debate, public service, and we're grateful to all five of these candidates for being here today. And in closing, if I can correct one thing, this was not an ELM event. This was a mm. collaborative event among many uh, nonprofits in the Commonwealth that work together collegially. We all work together. And so, and their names are all posted mm. on a uh, poster outside. And I would like now for all of the sponsor, leaders of the sponsoring organizations to stand and stay standing and be recognized. Would you all stand? Would their members and supporters please stand? The members and supporters please stand? Would all those who support more aggressive actions in environmental protection and combating climate change please stand? And all those who will vote for a cleaner environment please stand? Thank you all for coming.